Welcome to the 47th episode of Renegade Marketers Live, a show that promises to be long on marketing insights and short on overhyped buzzwords. We'll be drinking in the latest tactics and the coolest gin. Yep, this may be the only live marketing show that also features a gin tasting. This show is being live streamed via our friends at Restream. And if you want to drink along at home, today we're tasting Ford's Gin versus Tang Gray. I'm your host, Drew Neiser, live from my home studio in New York City. On the list of things I've never heard CMOs say is, oh shoot, my budget is too large. In truth, most marketers are budget challenged, forcing them to find the most efficient way to spend their dollars. It is in, it is in this pursuit that the term ABM or account based marketing is most often mentioned. The big idea here is that instead of targeting a galaxy of prospects, you zero in on a subset of prospects that fit a specific criteria. And then depending on the technology you deploy, you have all sorts of ways to potentially engage and track these prospects all through their buying journey. But where does one start with ABM and how do you know when it's time to add another layer of technology? How do you make sure your sales team is actively participating in ABM from the beginning? So many questions, but lucky for you, we have three amazing marketers to help you sort out the most, most of these questions, if not all of them. Okay, with that, let's bring on Charles Groom, VP of Marketing at Biz2Credit. Among his many accomplishments, Charles has the distinction of being the youngest marketing leader on this show and was recently nominated for the Forbes 30 Under 30. Welcome, Charles. Hey, Drew. Yeah, great to be with you. And uh, if you can believe it at this very late date in the pandemic, I'm currently coming in from home in New York City as well. But due to COVID, I'm quarantining. So uh, doing oh. all right here. But uh, but yeah, just just a uh, little heads up there in case the voice is a little nasally oh my god so you are in fact uh you are um you have covid right now uh not confirmed but very highly suspected my my wife did test positive last week so well, yeah all yeah. right but the good news is there's there's always time for for abm discussions and, and marketing chatter gets me energized so we're i'm ready to go um, unbelievable. The dedication. No wonder you're uh, you're on that 30 under 30 list. Now, one of the things I noticed in your bio is that you had more relevant internships than I think I've ever seen on any any LinkedIn pro. Did you sleep in college? Well, definitely not as much as I should have. And, and actually, that's why I'm wearing the glasses these days. Uh, you know, got some eye strain from it. But I, I think, yeah, even going back to college, I was just always really hungry and excited to be in front of customers, you know, doing the big things that we all do in, in the marketing world. And I just, I don't know, I loved from the very beginning, I loved having that impact, seeing, you know, the impression volume, seeing kind of uh, what, what kind of effect you can have on people through media. So yeah, I, I did a, a whole range of things. You know, I did internships from customer experience. I mean, I was taking customer service calls uh, from my dorm room for, for a semester. I did product management. I was really fortunate actually to get certified as a scrum master early on while I was still in college. And then on the other side, I mean, I love creativity and, and media. And actually, I, I ended up running the TV club at Boston College, uh, which was kind of my passion project on the side. So yeah, everything left brain, right brain in marketing, it, it, it kind of all works together for me. Amazing. Um, so let's switch gears and let's get to the topic at hand. Can you talk about biz to credit and where ABM fits in to your marketing mix? 
Yeah. So ABM is, has been something I've been interested in for, for years. I mean, really from the time I jumped into the industry in the B2B SaaS world. At Biz to Credit, we've got, uh, we're a, a fintech company. We're a small business financing provider. And we've actually got two sides to our business. And ABM really fits into uh, one side of our business specifically, which is our, our SaaS product, Biz2x. And that's a technology that we sell to bankers and, uh, and financial institutions. And it helps them to actually provide loans to their small business customers. So this ABM strategy that we're talking about today is a perfect fit. You know, our total addressable market there is maybe 5,000 banks in the U.S. We're, we're selling to committees, you know, so we have to go and get the right people inside of these, these companies. It's all enterprise sales, so it's long sell cycles. I mean, ABM really is just kind of the perfect fit for that whole product uh, of ours. Um, interesting. And so we've got these 5,000 folks that, that in theory, 5,000 companies and then 10 people per company. So it's actually yeah. not as small a list as, as you would think. And I seem to recall that you're at the beginning of your journey. Can you talk about sort of the ramp up challenges? I mean, we now have established that there are 5,000 plus another, you know, 50,000 people that you want to somehow or other track and engage. Where, where are you in the journey and how do you sort all that out? Yeah. So, I mean, we are, to be fair, we are right at the beginning of our journey. I mean, we are, we are pre-implementation on our ABM tech, uh, if you will, just have gone through the vendor selection process for a pure play ABM solution. But I look at us as kind of in this hybrid role because we've been running ABM as a strategy for years already. We launched Biz2X in 2019 brought it to market with a brand new branding and identity. And right about that time is when we really started to get specific. Our sales team and our marketing team sat down and said, let's carve up this market. Let's think about what are the best types of accounts that we want to go after. And we really got specific. And so I kind of say like on the ABM tech side, yes, we're at the very beginning of our journey. But on the ABM strategy side, we're actually pretty mature. I mean, we've been doing this for three, three plus years. Sales is on board. They're heavily involved. We're running some of these, you know, plays now. Uh, we're, we're introducing everything, both online and offline tactics in really trying to nurture these, these target accounts in our ABM picture. So it's a little bit of a, a, a mishmash, Drew. It's, it's both and, you know? So let's talk, when you say We've been doing it for a long time and we have a strategy. Talk about that. Uh, Cause I think, you know, lots of uh, words are important. Definitions are important. We talk a lot about that in CMO huddles, right? Is getting agreement of what these words mean. So what are we talking about when we say our ABM strategy? Yeah. So for us, it starts with that total universe. And then it's a question of segmenting down into different groupings of that universe. So there's a, a population of about 5,000, maybe 6,000 lending institutions in the United States that are issuing loans to small businesses. We looked at that as our total realistic addressable market for the Biz2x platform. But we were, we were also realistic with ourselves. We don't need to sell 100% of that market, especially not in year one, two, or three, in order to meet our, our business goals. So what we wanted to do is figure out what are, the, what are a couple of dimensions on which we can segment that market down and start to get much more precise about which of these companies are worth spending marketing dollars against. And then it's about, you know, from there, it becomes about deployment into the channels where you have opportunity, whether that's LinkedIn, which is a critical, I think, platform for, for most folks in the B2B world, um, other kinds of solutions that allow you to advertise on uh, different you know, DSP services start to come into play. But also, what trade shows are we going to send the sales team to? Uh, and, and that comes into the fold as well. So for us, it, this strategy really is all about starting with how do we narrow this audience down to a population that we can really, really go after in a meaningful, substantial way and have some, some real success against? 
And, and then we want to be able to take that out into what results our sales team is actually seeing. Uh, so it stays somewhat fluid. For example, every single one of our account executives has a quarterly top 25 accounts that they are targeting and prospecting. And our marketing team responds in kind. And if they change their tar target 25, we change our target 25 to match. So, and these target 25 for each of these salespeople have been defined by probably business size and length where they are in terms of, you know, traditional adoption of technology. And you just put a bunch of criteria. So we, we took it down from, I mean, I have, you know, 5,000 to a manageable number. Um, yeah. So like for us, it's like 150 at a time that we're really, really ramped up uh, and advertising to through, through our, our quote unquote ABM tactics. And, you know, the sales, uh, the sales people are rotating inside of that 150. So it, it, it will fluctuate over the course of the year. We might be reaching 350 accounts with some real serious ABM activities. And that's really where we got to right before we decided to make the plunge and acquire the technology that's now going to go and you know support this in a much more comprehensive way rather than what we've done up until now, which is you know good old classical marketers and salespeople getting in a spreadsheet, figuring it out and you know sharing it on OneDrive, for instance. Yeah, uh, there's there's no doubt in it. And uh, our next guest uh, actually uh, is totally into that, which we'll get to. But I my guess my last question on this is and or the observation is you've spent a lot of time getting the strategy right before you adopted the technology. And and I think that's just an important observation for any of you thinking about this is the technology is great, and, and we'll talk about that later in the show, but you need to have a plan and you need to have agreement with the sales force. And it seems like you have both of those things in place, right, Charles? I 100% agree, Drew. I mean, you've got to have sales bought into what you're doing. It's, it really helps if you can have your, your head of sales come to the table and evaluate your ABM options with you and give, your, give his or her input into that process as well. And, and, and last thing, I got to give a plug for CMO huddles before, you know, before I finish my remarks, Drew, because because honestly, when it came right down to it, getting that third party experience from other marketers is really, really critical. And I got some great advice from folks that I'm networked into with the CMO huddles who said, you know, take a look at this set of vendors, maybe try, you know, and, and take a look at some technology that you might not otherwise that doesn't advertise itself as ABM, but might really serve your needs. And we've, as a result of that, we found kind of a, a really nice best of breeds position that I'm, I'm excited for us to take forward to start implementing with. Perfect. Well, we'll come back to you, Charles. Thank you for that plug. Awesome. Um, exactly what CMO Huddles is all about. We're going to talk about CMO Huddles in a second, but I want to welcome Chip Rogers, who is the CMO of Workspan, star of episode 177 of Renegade Marketers Unite and episode 10 of this show. Hello, Chip. How are you and where are you today? Hey, Drew. I'm good. I'm actually Oops, in uh, San Carlos. I'm in, the, I'm in the Bay Area, um, uh, San Francisco Bay Area. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Now you and I met, God, it feels like a long time, 11 years ago, I think when you were running this huge community of users for SAP. Uh, and in fact, two that million, interview, two million, that we, members. two million members. Yes. <laughs> uh, and I, I'm wondering if, by the way, just in case anybody is, so Chip is featured in my first book. Uh, but the, oh, look at that. <laughs> Which chapter was it, Chip? <laughs> just happens it's to be chapter I, I i it's chapter oh gosh it's on page there 219 it is. all right we have proof i don't make this stuff up look at that uh <laughs> building you a community awesome okay so i'm wondering i'm thinking back 11 years is there something you have learned that you wish you knew back then <laughs> oh gosh well the world has changed so much you know so it's uh yeah quite 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 a bit. Uh, just the whole, I think even ABM is, uh, there were sort of rudimentary, uh, you know, capabilities back uh, back in those days. But 
the technology is just has really just uh, grown tremendously. Yeah, just, and it and I feel like it's evolved where we all used to talk about you know having a hyper targeted marketing plan, um, but I, I think ABM is a lot. Uh, there's a lot more to it than the old school definition. So talk where you are on your uh, ABM journey, specifically sort of strategically. Yeah. So there are a couple of, we, you know, we, we think of ABM in a couple of different ways. Um, <clears throat> one is, uh, and I would say this is the more sort of traditional kinds of things where we are looking at, we're working with accounts and we're trying to really, you know, uh, build presence and and get uh, get things to happen within specific accounts. So they could be named accounts uh, where we're trying to get traction uh, and we're going after, you know, some of our kind of sort of ICPs within those accounts. And then it could also be expands. So we have a lot of activity with expands where our, and actually our BDRs are working, our EEs to kind of rams in new areas within the company, uh, an existing company and see whether there are, you know, new part. So Workspan is a SaaS platform for uh, helping companies co-sell with their partners. Um, and actually we're doing that with, uh, we're the first, uh, just last year we came out with uh, the, uh, uh, the the capabilities to co-sell with hyperscalers. So Microsoft, uh, AWS, and and now Google. And so it's, it's really, you know, tremendous opportunity, but we've got to, you've got to find these different, partner programs within our existing customers. And it could also be new use cases. So there are a lot of expansion opportunities. Uh, and so that's very specifically, you know, an ABM uh, approach. So, so that's one, one side. And then the other side is the technology. You know, we, last year we brought in six, uh, six cents, which has been fantastic. Just uh, six cents is, is um, for those of you that are, maybe thinking about it, the idea is that it's a, it's a predictive analytics. So it looks at all of the things that you've the behavior that your accounts, your people, people at different accounts have been, have been over the years. And then it says, okay, well, what accounts look like that now that have closed in the past? So let's go focus on them. Let's prioritize activities on those because they have, you know, higher intent uh, based on <clears throat> previous activities. So I Interesting. Yeah, that's, that's I wanna, yeah. yeah, I want to th dig into that a little bit more to make sure that I get wrap my mind around it. Because I always thought of Sixth Sense as being really strong with intent data, meaning that they can sort of based on either third party or first party activity, sort of help you identify people that may in fact be in the market or showing intent, right? But what you're talking yeah. about is, and that's I know that's part of it, but what you're talking about is looking at past customers and say, this next customer is probably this and predicting who they're be. So they're not only uh, helping you uh, sort of engage with the people that you might have on a, had on your list, they're helping you build the list. Oh yeah. Yeah. And prioritize the list, right? They all, every, everyone gets a, it's, it's uh, it, coming out of it as a, six QA score it's called, but it's, uh, you know, it's basically, it scores different accounts. So you want to, uh, and they actually have analytics that say the, uh, of your current pipeline, which ones were in six QA previously. And so you can see that you just like, you show that to the sales team and it's like, you got a higher probability of turning this into a deal. If you focus on these accounts instead of these accounts that, that are not in, you know, showing intent. And let's talk about that. Has that been, because one of the big things and I remember in, in the few modules that I went through the training program or certification program for ABM, really emphasized, uh, this was on demand base, but really emphasized the need for getting sales involved at the beginning. So when you bring that or the system says, hey, this, this guy's hot based on intent, are sales folks now sort of responding in a way that says, oh, yeah, and drop everything? Or are they still sort of <laughs> in the mode of, uh, you know, I, I'm going to uh, go hunt and and kill on my own? Just brute force it, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, 
So a little bit of a mixed, you know, a little bit of everything. So first of all, the BDRs uh, are uh, totally dialed into Sixth Sense. So they're they're focusing there and we help them, right, with um, sequences that are just really populated by accounts that are in 6QA. Um, and, you know, so the, the BDRs are definitely focused there. Uh, AEs are, you know, we sort of regularly to kind of try and remind them and do things like that. We do uh, training and enablement sessions. And I would say that the prospect, the, the folks that are prospecting definitely are, are more involved um, and, and using it. Uh, we have some AEs that have existing accounts that are just, they're just basically farming in those accounts. And so they're not so much. So Right. So if I go back to the BDRs and I get this, I mean, the, and my job is to set up a meeting, right? That's, to yep. get a meeting and which yeah. is then a meeting. A, right right a and <laughs> the the good news is in theory without being creepy they have enough information that says that this person is likely to be interested because they've demonstrated intent so i got to believe that it's a more fun job than yeah yeah. Right then, then the then the time without that data, you're just you know you you get a lead that may or may not be one. There's so much more data these days. It's uh, yeah, both the, and like you said, it's it's first party and third party uh, data. It's how they're how they've been acting with and in interacting with some of our marketing activities of the website, but it's also where are they doing searches? How are they doing? Are they doing keyword searches on things that are that are relevant for us? And so, yeah, you've got to, and what's interesting about the, about ABM is that, you know, you're, you're not just going after a single person at an MQL, right? You're, it's, it's aggregating all of this behavior across an account and, a, and an account go, you know, shows intent when you start seeing multiple people, you see a group of people, like a lot, number of people are all, you know, engaging and trying to figure something out it's like okay well there's there must be a pro some kind of a project going on there yeah, we don't yeah. know about it you know they kind of they call it the dark funnel right we don't know about it but something's happening and so the earlier the better better off you're going to be Catch right and you get you get smarter and smarter in theory about serving up the right information at the right time for those folks that are on the journey but what what occurs to me with all of this is it's a very different mindset in that, you know, we've talked about this in huddles that that in some ways, a marketer's job is to obviously get people interested in the product or service, but there's also the capture the demand part, right? And and where ABM sort of fits in a little bit of both of that, right? Because you it enables you to capture demand because when six people of the 10 buying committee suddenly show up on your website looking at the demo or doing some other things, you know they're in the market. So at that moment in time, you're really yeah. trying to capture demand. And then there's a bunch of other people who may come to a webinar or may check an article out. They're really not in the market. They're thinking about it. They might be later, even though they're, you're on your list. And even though they're even, you know, they're on your list because they have the money, <laughs> but they're not on your list because necessarily they're ready. They're even interested in buying. Yeah. So, you know, the other thing we've, we've, we've we've done and and six cents sort of has these two sides one is the sales side which we've just been talking about but then the other side is the marketing side which is okay well, if these are our target you know accounts and 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 icps then you're able to run paid campaigns into those accounts with specific messages so one of the things that we've done is and there are a lot of different plays that you can do with that but one that we've done that was uh, a lot of fun and and successful is we've had um we've had some big deals that were about to close they were in sort of late stages which means you've got a lot of buying committees are going to you know they're getting to they're going to security they're going to finance they're going to it they're going to all these different other groups so we built some targeted campaigns just for that account for VPs and directors in with those other titles they're not normally our ICP, but like, all right, let's expand out into the buying group to make sure that they're aware of who Workspan is uh, and that, you know, they know that we're a, a known entity. Uh, and you see, you get all the data from that as well. Like how many, how many views, how many clicks, all those things. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. I, I, uh, 
I'm really glad you shared that story. I have more things I want to circle back on, but we've got to keep moving. I'll come back because I do want to talk right. about partnerships. Um, and I also love this idea of late deal helping to close. Okay, but we're going to go on um, and welcome Grant Johnson, who is the CMO of Embers and star of episodes 249 and 287 of Renegade Marketers Unite, frequent guest on this show. Hello, Grant. Welcome back. Hey, Drew. Great to be here. Happy to join you today. Thank you. Well, um, by the way, um, where are you on this uh, fine late summer day? Well, I'm in paradise, of course. I'm in Southern California. Perfect tennis weather. And you know I like that. And, uh, you know, it's uh, high 70, so there's no complaints we're going to have to get on the tennis court when I come out there uh, this this fall. Um, Good for sure. Uh, perfect. That would be. So now speaking of Southern California, semi Southern California, I noticed you got your BA at UC Santa Barbara, which is one of the few universities in the world that has its own beach, or at least it's right on a beach. Uh, I happen to I'm growing up in Southern California, visited there when I was in high school. And of course, the thing I remember besides playing volleyball on the beach during a, this was leadership camp, getting tar on my feet. So, you know, that must have been really hard in college to get tar on your feet. It must have been a hard experience. Yeah, no distractions whatsoever at UC Santa Barbara. And then I did my graduate work at Pepperdine. So I guess I like somewhere near the beach. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, uh, good times. Yes, indeed. Southern California. Let's talk about your CMO, your ABM journey, what your strategy is, what's going on there. You know, I, I actually started the uh, ABM uh, journey literally 10 years ago. And I just have to put it in context. When you and I met about that time, I was CMO of a company called Pegasystems. And we, we had target account marketing. We didn't call it ABM then. We didn't have a tech stack to enable it like your first two guests have been talking about, and obviously I can share as well. Uh, but it's been great uh, to have picked a tool and to really, for us, we the key thing, a couple of our guests, you know, talked about it uh, earlier and, uh, you know, Charles and Chip and really had to get alignment. I mean, there was no way we were going to go implement uh, a platform that we've done without BDR sales 100% uh, in line with us. And, so we have that. We actually rolled it out at kickoff and trained everybody, which was in January of this year. And, um, you know, the way I describe where we are in the journey is we, we noticed early on that one of the regional VPs, let's just say we have East Enterprise, we have West Enterprise, just jumped in, got he and his team trained, was utilizing the tool, giving us feedback, and the other wasn't. And guess what? Their numbers weren't looking quite as good. So the CRO, my peer, my buddy said, hey, time to get with the program. And sure enough, within about 30, uh, 45 days, once they really adopted the tool, put it into practice, so their results started improving. So I'm, I'm clearly a believer. And it, it's so interesting. I And again, I sort of remember that from the thing is sometimes when you're adopting ABM and you're getting a little sales resistance, find the one you know, salesperson that will execute um, with you and go all in. And when their numbers start to look good, they'll go, wait, how'd you do that? And suddenly everybody goes to that side of the book because this is looking pretty good. Uh, so um, you're using, I think you're using demand base, right? We are. We okay. Are. And talk about how, what that does for you. Well, for us, it you know, you begin both your uh, the earlier uh, folks, uh, Charles and Chip, were talking about it. Is uh, we had been using Intent uh, for I've been here about three years at Inverse as CMO, and you know that's been helping us. And uh, I won't name other uh, companies because, as you said, you got to pick the right particular technology that fits within your stack that you can implement. You've got somebody who can operate and tweak, and so you know that 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 was pretty uh, pretty important. But for us, we had to have good integration with. Salesforce. We actually also have it integrated with SalesLoft that we use and with Marketo. And if somebody reaches, we were talking about scored accounts or they reach our magic number of 100. It doesn't matter what your number is. You know, it's a buying group. You can have a couple people do something or one person request a demo. You can get what we call a, a marketing qualified account, auto scored. But, uh, but it really helps when the entire team is looking at the same set of data 
and we've coordinated the action. So marketing can provide insight that sets off a BDR uh, trigger, or the BDR can provide insight that sets off a sales trigger. And so it helps us work together more effectively. And I, I don't know if you get in, in there under the hood, but um, I had a chance to look under the hood of, of a couple of these platforms. And it feels like you could just get, you could get in there and spend hours <laughs> sort of, look, there's some, somebody just clicked on that or somebody clicked on that. What's the big picture from a CMO standpoint that you've learned to make sure, you know, you're paying attention to the right things and don't get down into the weeds of this? It's a great question, Drew. And I had the same feeling. I, I did another tour with my, uh, my you know, single threaded owner, one of my VPs, I call it an STO, single threaded owner, who oversees across all these functional areas to make sure it's work. But I could see you could just get lost. There's so much, you know, configurability and granularity in the man base, among others, that, you know, you could lose the forest for the trees. But I, I take the step back and we all align at Embers on our shared responsibility to deliver pipeline that can translate to booking. So we report on like a lot of other CMOs, a lot of KPIs, and it's not only marketing source pipeline, but you know, marketing source revenue, right? Um, and so we wanna make sure that the, the, the tactics, the, 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 the strategy, the program, the tactics are all to the prioritized folks that we have by small business, mid-market, corporate we call it, enterprise, and that we're, we're driving the right si uh, uh, type of uh, focus, uh, actions and activities that produce uh, results. And so we'll compare team to team, we'll compare month to month, year to year, and we get this data that tells us, hey, you know, are we doing the right thing? Because like you said, you could go down the rat hole and infinitely optimize and not get a better result. To us, it's about driving more pipeline that sales can close faster. So volume velocity for a higher value and value so we can make or exceed our bookings targets. You know, I, I, I want to put a pin on for a moment on marketing sourced revenue. Because if I, I did a survey of the uh, CMOs of CMO huddles, I'm not sure <laughs> that half of them could actually come up with that number. And I want to sort of, and it, cause it's not an easy number. And, and there's also, you know, there's all sorts of attribution questions and there's, you know, who's taking credit for the lead and sales force. And I'm just curious, can we just stop for a second? And how do you get to market? How are you confident in a marketing source revenue number? Well, we, you know, we, we, we tag the lead source, Salesforce. We, you know, we have visible in the other part of our tech stack. And uh, so we do, you know, uh, multi-source attribution. Um, and at the end of the day, you're right. There are some that are mistagged, but the general uh, direction is never questioned. The, the general data, uh, because, you know, if it's 5% noise, why have a 95% argument over 5% right. noise, right? So I may be contributing, let's just say 50%, of revenue and maybe it's 45 and 50 but it's not 20 and it's not 80 right and so i think that's how we overcome the argument we actually had a discussion like i've had this other stops where we were talking over attribution fortunately uh my ceo eric frazier said look marketing touches everything so like let's not get up hung up in precise attribution but we have to contribute and together we have to meet the target and so that's what we work on we have monthly pipeline reviews like i'm sure a lot of my peers do and work with the various contributors and stakeholders. What can we do better? What are the gaps? How do we address those? And that helps us drive, you know, the right behaviors. So, and I, I, I I'm going to just make a reinforce this point. The reason why, in my mind, marketing source revenue is so important is you can stand in front of a CEO and CE, CFO, and they'll get it, or a board of directors. Or, you know, your venture capital or PE firms, they will get that number and nod their head and say that marketing is working. You could talk about brand all day long. <laughs> and even though as a marketer, we know that just, you know, driving demand is, 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 yes, that is part of it. But there's a lot more to the role. As your CEO says, marketing touches everything. All right. Before we sort of break for a second, I want to ask is there something that's working really well for you on the ABM front? I mean, Chip mentioned, and I thought this was fascinating. He mentioned that uh, they're, you know, sort of running ads against companies as that are that are close to a deal closing. 
um, which I thought that makes sense. Um, yeah, you know, for our highest strategic accounts, we've done some of the one to one. We do more one to one to few, one, one to many tactics. I, I would just say that the insights that we've talked about intent about you know the the relative uh, activity level because you know you can do a journey map and shows marketing touches, sales touches with demand base, and I'm sure other tools have something similar. And it helps both the BDRs and the sales teams and the t- sales teams working with BDRs say, hey. You know, I think Chip mentioned, let's go focus here. I mean, you could focus anywhere. In fact, I was talking to our VP who runs the BDRs the other day, and he said, look, you know, we're just going to totally prioritize in super responsiveness to an auto-scored MQA. Like, if this person wants to demo, I mean, it's great that other people are doing things that are adding to the buying group, and maybe I should nurture them or outreach, do an outreach sequence. But boy, if they're that far into the, you know, interest level, let's go after those. So I think Having that insight by sales team, by segment, because we, we go to market all, not only by segment, by verticals, by buyer, because, you know, we have different personas and said, hey, I got lots more buyers involved from this company, uh, you know. And so we use that day to help fine tune focus and, and effort so we can get get the best return. That's the part that's working the well. There's no, you know, there's no one silver bullet that suddenly it's easy to, to you know, source and close deals. I wish there were. But it's getting, you know, it's at least we have more insight so we can make more informed decisions on where to focus and how to drive better outcomes. And it's so interesting as you were talking, I, I'm remembering I interviewed John Miller more than 10 years ago when he was at Marketo. And it was the early days of Marketo. And what he talked about at that moment was using Marketo. Um, you will be able to see when someone clicks on a demo or the pricing page, they are like 50 times more likely to be a real prospect than anybody else. And I never forgot that. And in many ways, this is just the tech evolution of that same notion in, in some ways. Uh, but it's, it's so much more sophisticated than it was uh, 11 or 12 years ago. All right. We are, um, we're going to take a second uh, where I am going to talk about CMO huddles, which uh, has already come up a c- couple times. Funny that we launched in 2020. CMO huddles is an exclusive community of over 100 highly effective B2B CMOs who share, care, and dare each other to greatness. And I was thinking about greatness the other day. And what we're talking about is being an effective marketer, yes, but also being a great leader. And we talk about that as well. Everything about CMO Huddles is designed to be a force multiplier, helping you to make faster, better, and more informed decisions, where one inspiring hour a month delivers 10 hours of perspiration save. Since no CMO can outwork their job, CMO Huddles is here to help you outsmart it. Now, we just happen to have three huddlers here, Charles, Chip, and Grant. And I'm wondering if if you all would mind, and Charles, you did this already, but share a specific example of how CMO huddles might have helped you, you know, make a decision or be a more effective CMO. I mean, I'll I'll share actually just even since we're on this AVM topic, it was actually about a year ago, a little, well, more than like a year and a half ago, we were just starting to think about investing in an AVM solution. And, and I brought it up on a, it was actually in a, in a huddle. And I think a couple other people raised their hand. Yeah, you know, I'd like to. And um, and I think maybe you'd heard it before, Drew. And, you know, Drew, you're like, I think we need a special huddle on, on ABM technology. And and it was well attended and it was really insightful. And I actually had a someone that was on was presenting and talking about it. And I had a separate call with them afterwards and really got just sort of firsthand knowledge from other CMOs on what's, you know, what works, what doesn't work and all that. So amazing. It was a demo, right? I think it was, uh, it was a demo that one of the CMOs uh, shared. Uh, yeah. and we got to yeah. see behind, under the hood, which is very cool. Um, okay. Charles. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I shared a little bit, but I can, I can get into more specifics really on the ABM tech front. We, we leaned heavily on other CMOs. You know, I, I've heard, uh, that uh, the Chip and Grant are using Sixth Sense and, uh, and Demand Base. We got recommendations to both of those platforms. You know, got some good, good inside baseball on what those platforms do and don't do. Um, we actually got uh, some referrals from. I, I had a whole meeting with a with a fellow 
chief marketer who said, you know what? I know you're looking kind of from the ground up. You've got some strategy in place. I would even consider, forget about going with one of the big boy traditional ABM platforms. And what if you just fill the gap of nurturing those accounts that are already sort of in the middle of the funnel? I think, Chip, you, you might have been making a similar point on that one. And, you know, there's a tool that he recommended to me that was, you know, right, right in line with that uh, during, our, our one -on -one, during our one on one conversation. It's called Influ2, uh, kind of cutting edge on, uh, on, the, on the very, very cutting edge of, uh, of going beyond, uh, beyond cookies and, and so forth in reaching out to individuals. That's, you know, they've got sort of a predictive model that says that they can reach individual decision makers in a buying committee. So, you know, those kinds of bits of advice, I think we, we would not have been in the position that we've been in to make, make the kind of decision we already did about ABM tech if it, if it wasn't for CMOs sharing and caring, like you say, Drew. Awesome. Thank you. Well, Grant, I know we've had you on the show. You've weighed in before. I don't know if you have anything to add in this, in this scenario. Yeah, I would kind of use my research uh, mantra about, you know, only uh, invest in the research if you're going to take advantage of it, right? Uh, and so same thing, you know, you only ask of a CMO to spend an hour a month, but I've gotten so much more value out of not just attending the hour a month, but as I listen to my peers, what are they doing? What's working? What's working better than what's working for us? Let me dig into that. And so I'll set up conversations afterwards. Obviously, CMO huddles will facilitate, hey, I'm looking to do a digital close on my website. Who's done that so we can do touch-free, you know, sales? And so I think all the value add is, you know, if you can commit to taking advantage of it, you're going to get a lot more out of it. Love it. Love it. All right. Well, we hey, happen hey, to Drew, have- I'll just, I'll just throw one, ahead, one other quick, quick thing in, which is, uh, is phenomenal, is that um, every, every huddle, you do a recap of all the comments you, and you anonymize it, right? One CMO said, blah, blah, blah. And those go, those go out on an email and in Slack. And I, I go back, like I save them all and I go back and look at them when there's a new topic that's coming up. I'm like, I think there was something a few months ago about, and then I'll look at what happened. They're really hugely valuable. Love it. Thank you for that. Thank you uh, all for those uh, kind words. So we happen to have some recorded comments and from some other huddlers. We're going to play that while we go grab our gin glasses. Charles, you're off the hook, given the fact that you have COVID. And um, we'll be right back. I love the way that you are able to bring together experts and practitioners to share their experiences and to accelerate learning. Just by listening, I've tripled my experience. It's a great way to have these conversations with your peers. Even if you miss you know, an actual live session, just the, the capture you guys do of the notes, the tidbits, the takeaways, just super valuable. It's, it's such a nice forum to be able to bond with other marketing leaders that are facing the same things that you are. There's just so much goodness from the learning dialogue and everything else. So it's really nice to connect to peers that are B2B. The Slack channel, I think, is amazing. There's just some really helpful ideas and thoughts and things being shared in there as a backstop underneath the, the huddle actual meetings. Because of the format of the CMO huddles, there's, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 people on each of the sub peer groups which makes it really easy to build one-on-one -on -one relationships. It's a community that I, I think I really needed right now, so thank you. If you're a B2B CMO who can share, care, and dare with the best of them, ping me, Drew Neiser, on LinkedIn, or apply at cmohuddles.com. Melissa. Take us through the gin tasting. Hi. I think um, Chip and Grant might just be listening and they'll taste after the show. So, <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, so we're, we're going to watch Drew taste Forge Gin <laughs> and Tanqueray and decide which one is his favorite. Um, I'm not sure if you guys got to try them before, but if you didn't, you can taste them after right. the show. Oh, Look at you that. got them, Chip. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I tried them over the weekend. Okay, perfect, perfect, perfect. Oh, good. So you have your tasting notes ready. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Okay, so let's go through these. First, we'll start with Ford's Gin. It was founded by Simon Ford. He realized the ultimate cocktail gin did not exist, and he got some of his friends together, and they started working on recipes. It wasn't until batch 83 that they made the perfect gin. So that'll be it. What do you think, Drew? 
It's funny. I would say it begs for tonic. <laughs> There you it's, go. The perfect does. cocktail gin. Yeah. I mean, it is. It just sort of begs for something. Um, I mean, it's there's. It's very. It's a. It's a very. I'm going to say complex taste. There's a lot going on there, right, Grant? I mean, what do you think? Yeah, I'm with you. I don't drink a lot of things straight, and this one could use a little a mixing, and and it would probably go down a little more smoothly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely not going to be my straight up martini gin without vermouth. I bet with a little vermouth, though, fine. Um, yeah. And I see that they have grapefruit peel in there, so it'll probably be good with a bit of grapefruit wedge. Huh. Yeah, <laughs> with the tonic, as in uh, our friends at uh, uh, Gunpowder. From Shamba. Yep. Yeah. All right, let's try the Tanqueray. We've had this one on the show before, um, and it's one of the most popular gins in the world today. It was first distilled in 1820 by Charles Tanqueray in Bloomsbury in London, and it's the same recipe from 200 years ago. Um, it's a it's a pretty decent solid gin, I think, from my own experience. Strong, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Um, again, I would not, this would not be my first choice for a straight up martini. Definitely. Uh, um, but I, I don't know. What do you think, Grant? Yeah, I think it's, it's bright. I mean, it's bold. It's, uh, again, needs a little, uh, softening with the <laughs> mixers, but, uh, it's got a distinct uh, flavor. I like that. It does. I, I have to admit it does have a distinct flavor and I'm, I'm, more fond of it in comparison to the Fords than I was before. So uh, I don't know, Chip, what'd you think? <clears throat> I liked them both. Um, but you know, I was just kind of in a mood. So, uh... <laughs> so I don't know are we, we got, do we got a winner here? And you, who, who wants Tangare versus Ford? Tangare, one Tangare. Probably Tangare is more more, more drinkable. drinkable. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Ford. You are down <laughs> at least two to one, maybe three. But uh, we'll have to all try it again soon with some tonic and a grapefruit thing. All right. Oh, but wait. We have a fun fact. Uh, uh, we have to bring on our botanical expert, Nicole. Hi, everyone. Hello, Nicole. So, um, we noticed Jasmine, and uh, you know what the heck is Jasmine other than the name of the princess in Aladdin? I mean, help <laughs> us out here. Well, Jasmine is a genus of about two hundred species of fragrant flowers, shrubs, and vines of the olive of the olive family. Jasmine symbolizes happiness, deep affection, and elegance in China, and it is used to treat fever, sore throat, mouth ulcers, and headaches. And, and maybe COVID, Charles. <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe COVID. Um, okay, Nicole, thank you. We'll see you later. Thank you so much. All right, let's get back to the topic at hand. Let's bring Charles back on. And we've talked a little bit about sales alignment. Um, and, you know, I think, uh, Grant, you mentioned that you got one salesperson going and rocking and that sort of brought. Um, is there anything else that we should... Um, the folks that are listening that are sort of working their way through ABM should be thinking about in terms of sales alignment. Anybody want to grab that one? I, I can just say from my perspective that having the head of sales be that person who's championing it's the strategy is, is a really great way to go um, and build a business case for bringing in the technology side of things. Because like we saw in our experience, we were doing ABM, but we weren't really supporting it with technology and, and dedicated solutions until I was able to have that conversation at sort of the, you know, peer to peer level across marketing and sales and say, you know, we really should be investing in it because you want more of these leads. We see how the how the results are working. Um, you know, and, and so we should both jointly make the business case, not just leave it up to the marketing team to go and, you know, carry that water ourselves. So I, I, I mean, that can, from my vantage point, that can, that can definitely be helpful. Um, you know, especially if you're starting in the place where I was, where you're kind of doing ABM Excel version, uh, <laughs> to start. 
Yeah. Um, and I feel that pain as uh, I have a feeling that's uh, and the, certainly the huddles team feels that pain, not having a uh, ABM tool to help. Uh, we are in the Excel version. So I'm wondering, uh, are there any landmines to avoid when it comes to ABM? Grant, you've been doing this a while. What 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 in your mind are sort of the, the warning signs, the danger zones? Yeah, I mean, you know, for me, um, integration, I, I think, is key. I think a lot of us CMOs, we're, there's no lack of tools. You know, a lot of them are table stakes. But, you know, this is one of those game changers with ABM. You want, you want to get it right, and you need to make sure that you've got enough time, the dollars for implementation, testing it, you know, ring out the system, confirm it doesn't break something else. I mean, none of this stuff is as easy as all, all vendors may claim it to be. So I think making sure you have that and then you have, uh, you know, checkpoints along the way. You don't, you don't set any of these things on autopilot. I, I, I not to say some technologies in the Mars tech stack can't pretty much run themselves once implemented, but this is one that you really want to, you know, have a lot of care and feeding to make sure uh, sales, marketing, BDRs are all getting the most value out of it. Yeah, I, uh, all of those things uh, ring true to me. Um, there is a world of, uh, uh, and and it takes a while. I'm curious, and, and maybe Chip, you can weigh in on this. How many people in terms of sort of, we'll call them MarTech professionals, people in your marketing ops team need to be sort of paying attention and looking at the ABM tool? How many do you need to use to make sure that, your, you know, since you can't run it on autopilot. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I'll answer that question, but also just on the question of time, I think uh, it, just anyone that's going to make the investment, be prepared that it takes, like once you sign up, it takes, took, I think it takes about two months to sort of understand, do all the coding, define every, all what all the activities are, categorize them, and then build the model and then test the model. And, you know, there's a lot of that sort of iteration um, before it, before you can actually go live. Um, and then, shoot, what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I um, it feels like two months is fast, by the way. Yeah, yeah, um, well... Yeah, it was. I mean, you know, it was. It, it it still it was like we were reaching to go. We're like, can you can you just turn it right. on now? Okay. The you question know. was, how many people did it take working? Oh, how many people? We're actually running it pretty lean. It's like there, are, we have three. We have one sort of ops person who's actually a contract contract person, um, and then uh, head of demand gen and our head of okay. BDRs. So not yeah. that many, but I I think the. The thing that's important with all these things, when you adopt a technology, not all technologies are replace jobs. They, in fact, require people to help you make the most of this. So now, mm -hmm. one of the things that I heard ultimately in all of this is that there are opportunities out there, and it's really important to act quickly and decisively and not letting opportunity slip away which is why when we ask the question, what would Ben Franklin say? We would say, he would say, take time by the forelock. And in case you're wondering what that literally means, it means grabbing time like the hairs on the head of a horse and pulling it with you. Think carpe diem. And I, and I, I think that's a fair interpretation of what we're talking about because it really is someone's come to your website, someone's exhibited the signs of a buyer. You want to make sure that, that you're really on, on top of them. So when you think about this, Charles, and at the beginning of your journey, you've got, you've got Grant and Chip has been doing this. Well, Grant, uh, Chip's been doing it a year or two. Grant's been doing it longer. What does success look like for you? In, a, in your ABM program, Charles? Yeah, I mean, success is going to start with sales feedback. And, and that's the, the saddest old school answer you can probably give, right? Is just how do they feel? What's the gut check? But it, I think it is going to start there uh, because we've had this, this partnership in bringing ABM technology into the company. And then from there, pretty quickly, I think we're going to look at the uh, metrics like 
the target accounts that we are having engagements with and, and what those engagement rates look like. And in a perfect long-term scenario, it's, it's going to be, because we obviously we've got an inbound as well as our ABM kind of dynamic going on here. I'd love to start to see crossover pipeline built between the two so that either we're able to generate inbound activity from accounts that we're going out and prospecting outbound or even vice versa where we might identify through inbound channels we might identify some of our new abm prospects and then go and sort of expand our, our reach in the buying community as a as a consequence of that you know that first inquiry or that first ebook engagement or what have you so i think you know for us it's going to start a little bit holistic and and gut checking, um, and, and then el- ultimately it's going to end with uh, what's the pipeline that we're influencing. And um, Chip uh, or or Grant, in terms of the evolved for you, I mean, Grant, we mentioned already KPI like uh, you know marketing driven revenue, but what's from an ABM standpoint, what does success look like to you? And or you want to add to Grant uh, to uh, Charles's. Uh, uh, answer pipeline Chip, yeah pipeline there you go pipeline it's, yeah we're <laughs> making our target there you go <laughs> chips is the shortest answer though that, that was good <laughs> right and so again this is why well, it's really you know i think it's profound to be thinking about happiness is your sales people saying damn we did it and you made it easier um we we made our numbers uh thanks to this program and plus all oh, their great salesmanship <laughs> uh, which is interesting. Okay. Um, I want to go around final words of wisdom for CMOs about to embark on the ABM journey. If you want, it could be two do's and a don't. It could be uh, just three thoughts on uh, how to do it. I'm going to do it in reverse order. We'll start with Grant. Well, you really need one person in charge of the success or failure. Uh, and as we talked about earlier, we also did it in two months, and I remember my uh, uh, head of uh, revenue marketing saying, hey, can we squeeze this thing into Q4? I said, well, gosh, it's kind of crazy, a lot going on, as I know, but if we do that, we, uh, we can uh, launch, announce, and train at kickoff. I said, let's do it. And so it was a 60-day March. Chip probably experienced something, something similar, but you know, there's a lot of things that didn't go well uh, in trying to get that in such a tight time frame, but having one person responsible cross-functionally, so made sure BDRs were on board, sales on board, tech was on board, ops was on board, uh, integration was on board, IT. That's really what enabled us to have a successful implement, implementation that we've sustained this year. Got it. So you had a deadline, you had a way of announcing, and even though it was not exactly perfect, you got it up and running because you had all of the right people at the table. Okay, um, Chip, other final words of wisdom? No, I, I would just say it's worth it. And, um, you know, if you're considering ABM and you're in the enterprise space, right, or, or even, even down, you know, down market, um, if you're in B2B sales, then, you know, it, it, it works. So. And when you say okay. it's wor- worth it, you're really, you're also saying not just an ABM strategy, but having, adopting a technology like a Sixth Sense or demand base. Um, to help you implement it. Yes, right. Got it. Okay, Charles, final yeah, words I mean, of wisdom. Probably premature for me to say <laughs> definitively that it's worth it, but I, I love the answer because that's how I feel. You know, I, I feel like we're, we're finally getting our shoes on and walking out the door with ABM here. Uh, I, I'll close kind of with the theme I've been harping on a little bit in my comments throughout the session, Drew, which is, just get partnered with sales from the get-go. You know, you can you can easily translate what you've been working on in in your you know Excel ABM strategy into the tools when you get there. So just don't worry about getting started with something and and then you know figuring out how to really make it more sophisticated when when you get to that level. And you know, that's, uh, I think, for a lot of marketers who are thinking about this, that, that becomes the hurdle is like the tools all take a lot of capital or at least some upfront investment, whether it's personnel or, or cost wise. 
you know, you don't have to wait for that just to be able to get started with ABM. Exactly. It's a strategy first. Perfect. Charles, thank you. Charles, uh, Chip, Grant, you're all great sports and super knowledgeable. Thank you, audience, for staying with us. Please join us on September 29th when we'll be talking about metrics with Khaled, D Khaled El Khatib, Deidre Hudson, and Kevin Sellers. Cue the music. Renegade Marketers Live is produced by Melissa Caffrey. Our intern is Laura Parkin. Our botanical expert is Nicole Hernandez. For the show notes, past episodes, and the latest on my book, Renegade Marketing, 12 Steps to Building Unbeatable B2B Brands, please visit renegade.com. I'm your host, Drew Neiser, and until next time, keep those renegade thinking caps on and strong.